that's an interesting point you make about it being a poison pill. Uh, do you think because Hong Kong has also had a several generations long um, history of Western rule and later democracy, uh, do you think that that the CCP essentially swallowing Hong Kong, which it's done since 2020, is that sort of a poison pill as well? And are we seeing any kind of impact uh, from Hong Kong on the rest of China? Well, I'd like to say that in Hong Kong, if you go to Hong Kong after 1997 is when, I, we are not talking of 2020, when it became very overt. From 1997, Beijing has had control of Hong Kong. Let's be honest about it. Uh, they had some freedoms because it was economically suitable or whatever it is. But uh, those very brave people who went and they basically said the same thing what we are saying now, that, you know, Hong Kong is a, was a free, it was never a free uh, uh, location. Even under the British, it was never a free colony. I mean, you have, you know, the governor generals of Britain, even the last chap, he talked a lot about establishing democracy in Hong Kong. It was very, with hardly. I mean, people in the elite, people who had money, they had much more influence. You had a rigged electoral system. So frankly, Hong Kong has never been a democracy. Taiwan is a democracy. Hong Kong had never been a democracy to solid up by the PRC in 1997. And since then, very gradually, the PRs, the CCP influence has grown in Hong Kong. The CCP presence has grown in Hong Kong, while the PLA has been there in case the Hong Kong people get the wrong impression that they're still, you know, either that they're a real democracy or that they're not, they're not part of China. In 2020, frankly, I mean, Deng Xiaoping gave a solemn promise about one country, two systems. Uh, actually, from not, you know, I wouldn't say Jiang Zemin's time. Jiang Zemin was very, very deferential towards the West. He was like, you know, if I may say so, uh, very deferential towards the West. And uh, he, uh, you know, for example, he wanted a fusion of Chinese music and Western music. When I used to go there during that particular time, it was horrifying. I mean, it was terrifying, but I was very polite. I couldn't say, my wife also, both of us found the music horrible. And we didn't dare say it in our room either because we were sure that uh, possibly somebody would be, you know, outside the window or something. And of course, we'll, we'll never be bugged by the communists. I mean, they don't do this kind of thing, you know. It's only you Americans who make these allegations. But we, the fact is the music was horrible. That fusion was horrible. Traditional music is beautiful, but that in the West... It's beautiful, country rock, for example, and in, in, in Taiwan or you know, with ethnic Chinese, it's beautiful, but the fusion is horrible. It actually began from Hu Jintao's time. The Xi Jinping is Hu Jintao on steroids. This whole question of China becoming a technological superpower, the whole question of China overcoming the United States, all that was there during Hu Jintao's time. And I used to basically, you know, listen to dinner table conversations at the party schools and other things and all that. In the provinces, the bigger cities, they know the line, they know the script, they're very careful. Fortunately, I'm a foreigner from India. I'm not a foreigner from Europe or a foreigner from the United States. You have to be much more careful of those foreigners. This guy is an Indian. I mean, India, you know, what, what can India do? At that point in time, I think they had that feeling. They don't have it anymore, but they had that feeling. So they were a little more open and they were very clear that we are going to overtake the United States. That was Hu Jintao's time, second or third year of Hu Jintao's uh, tenure, tenure. So it began there. Xi Jinping basically made that overt. As far as Taiwan is concerned, there was an indefinite, no timeline on that, which is a sensible thing to do. But Xi Jinping was in a hurry because he wants to be chairman, I mean, not chairman, general secretary of the, of the CCP for life. Now, he gerrymandered a third term, and I think that is the biggest mistake the man has made in his life. And I think the biggest mistake the Communist Party of China made in his life was agreeing to that because that has basically turned off a lot of individuals within the Communist Party. The fact is, it's a bureaucracy. It's a bureaucracy where if the boss likes you, you, you move up. If the boss dislikes you, you get shoved down. And the same boss, for at least the, the saving graces, the boss 
and those and the sub bosses and the prime bosses and the sub sub bosses many of them change over 10 years so you wait 10 years you know chinese are patient people indians also are patient people western people are a little less patient if i may say so you go you're given four year terms and you you put out people at the end of four years but anyway uh, the the point is very simply that he moved very fast in ensuring that tech, china became a tech superpower mostly by stealing technology mostly but xi jinping made it overt so what we are calling the big change under xi jinping is actually putting on steroids the change already visible under hu jintao the real creator of the china dream was hu jintao the guy who tried to empower china to take over take on the united states economically and finally you know africa asia latin america and he went back to an old theory of the ccp a theory that was enunciated by lin biao the cities will be conquered by the villages the cities are the west the villages are everybody else the rest what you call the west and the rest and uh, you know mr xi uh, the only point about him was that we are going to be the lords of the city i don't recall hu jintao's people being as explicit that the han people are you know the white people at one time i mean they were superior but actually we are the real master race and we are the true pure race and the white people will have to give way and we will come and take over i don't i have not really seen uh, i've seen signs of confidence but i have not seen that kind of ethnic uh, supremacy uh, in his time i think that feeling of supremacy was given a huge boost during uh, during from the time xi jinping became the ccp general secretary and possibly he believes it now i happen to believe that ethnically frankly it makes no damn difference what you are um, you have for example rishi sunak out there as the prime minister of the uk i'm not entirely sure that you can tra- track trace him to the you know the old if i may say so uh, i mean the ancestors uh, of uh, of people who have been in england for several generations i don't think so you have uh, uh, one person standing against trump nikki haley she is 100% from the subcontinent from from india you know and uh, some people are a bit vulgar they they you know make fun of ethnicity they make fun of her family name i think family names ethnicity is a thing that nobody should really make fun of but sometimes politics you don't become very polite anyway the point i'm trying to make is that the taiwanese are today completely different from the mainland chinese even if they remove the ccp from power even if there's a meltdown a mainlander is going to be different from a taiwanese as different as a mainlander was in 1949 from people who have been settled in taiwan for 2 3 4th and more generations that's my point today there's a fundamental difference not just in the political system but in the cultural dna of the taiwanese and the ethnic china go coming back to ma ma what you what did ma uh, talk to his ancestors about he described all that he has done and then he said what am i looking at i'm looking at a unified china under the kmt i mean frankly i don't think the kmt and the ccp shared very good relations with each other and they were had into a forced marriage uh, thanks to the united states uh, armed forces i mean you know uh, general stillwell and others vinico jo stillwell and others but frankly they never liked each other and here is ma at the grave of, of, of his ancestors in china saying that i one day we are going to come back and we are going to reclaim uh, the whole of china and he made that promise to the ancestors i think from that point of time the kind of welcome he had in the mainland i think it dimmed a little bit well so it sounds like uh, based on what you're saying uh, the idea that the chinese communist party puts out about a unification of china and taiwan basically cannot happen by any other means other than extreme force Uh, like they will have to break the Taiwanese people. 
I absolutely agree for a simple reason that when the CCP takes over a place, it basically takes over the political system. In Hong Kong, you obeyed the rules or you never progressed. Now you had these Hong Kong governments. The first you know, few years, there was this belief that, no, we are different, we are not, we are not PRC. After that, the, guy, the people who, were, who led Hong Kong, who were selected to lead Hong Kong, not elected, and I'd like to say that right from you know, the, the time of the British, they've been selected mostly. Chris Patton selected many people. I mean, Chris Patton did not introduce democracy in Hong Kong, although, I mean, Sir Patton or Lord Patton or whatever he's called now, goes around saying that I made Hong Kong a democracy. Sorry, it is no democracy at all. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, it is as much a democracy as the Governor General wanted it to be. But it's as much a, a democracy as the CCP wants it to be, which is zero. At least the British got made Hong Kong a 20% democracy. Taiwan is now a 100% democracy. That's the difference. Singapore may be 60%. I mean, you have Thailand, you have Vietnam, you have the Philippines, you have different countries where you have a large ethnic Chinese population. Taiwan is a completely 100% democracy. The CCP want, will dismantle that immediately. There's no way of doing that except by brute force. So you're perfectly right. Anybody who's got a delusion of peaceful unification is basically saying, I'm perfectly happy to be what the Chinese are in China, completely under the control of the party machine.